All right, welcome back. If you're just joining us, this is still the press coming to you live from the Abuja studios of Captain Television. And like I promised earlier, now we've been joined by Dr. Law Mefo. He's a public affairs analyst. And together, we shall be looking at the headlines that I just read out to you. And this is also a reminder that our phone lines are now open for you to call and join the conversation. Thank you so much for joining us again on the program. Thank you. It's always amazing to have you. Yeah, my I pleasure, <laughs> you know, hanging out here with you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, now let's get into the business of the day. I want to start with uh, what's going on in the tertiary institutions because you are, you are a lecturer, you are an educationist. I want to know what your thoughts are. Yeah. So we've seen f yesterday on our national dailies, we read out that most of the tertiary institutions have hiked their fees by over 200 percent for some and over 150 percent for others and they said this was done to um, improve the quality of education in the tertiary institutions since the government was not doing anything it's more like the schools have taken the laws into their own hands and on our national daily today federal government has no choice but to fund universities it is constitutional and that's according to asu so what are your thoughts on all of this well you see nigeria is a fast and degenerating to an enclave where um anarchic behaviors are taking the center stage um for universities for example you have uh, the main commission that is uh, dealing with uh, what you may call um, quality control when it comes to content mm. that is uh, the national university commission then uh, ultimately you have the ministry of education yeah federal and um the federal ministry of education um is uh, there to ultimately regulate superintend and uh, um, pursue and enforce policies yeah. that uh, govern uh, education uh, or the educational sector in the country and um, for federal institutions that are obviously under the uh, federal uh, ministry of education to go ahead to set you know fees for themselves and for their students mm. for me it is overreaching and um, i do not want to believe that they are doing that without approval from the federal government mm. it's just like when a you know npc decides to you know hike full level price but, but, mm. and they say it's because they are a limited liability company but it's a company wholly owned by nigeria and nigerians in other words mm. whatever you do you do on behalf of uh, the government of federal republic of nigeria so you can't do much it without counts. approval mm. so when they carry out such actions you know it's an ambush against nigerians i do not want to believe that the, the institutions went ahead to make such decisions on their own possible okay so you know that's my takeaway if it is um uh, in line with my thoughts you know that indeed something subterranean is happening behind the scene mm. it's only unfortunate because i had expected and i believe i once recommended that it is important that we really bring the stakeholders to the table to review the education, education sector, sector and take very deep you know reassuring decisions mm. that will enable us to recover the sector because if you want to talk about the future the future is education if you want to talk about a knowledge-based society it's, a, it's all about education if you don't do that you are um, encouraging ignorance mm. and ignorance will take you to nowhere and worse still half-baked educated the uh, uh, you know citizens may even be worse than people who are outrightly ignorant so you need to really do something about the sector i am also of a well considered uh, view mm. that education shouldn't be free totally yeah you know it should be you know reasonably priced and that is why i was talking about stakeholders coming together to say look we in go federal government can no longer carry this through mm. all by itself that guidance and parents will have to really uh, share the body mm. the question is to what extent? extent do you understand it can the decision should not be unilateral government 
going uh, behind the scene mm. and uh, altering uh, the uh, figures yes. that you now call the school fees and shoving it down the throats of uh, parents. Of, uh, of parents. Mm. It, it, by so doing, we are indirectly telling the uh, parents that there is no government. That is what it is. Okay. Now, for what you have um, produced, you, you can see that there is already a disparity. Some are charging 100%, some 150%, mm. some 200%. So we'll we go further up and all that. It ought not to be. There should be a policy direction okay. that is centralized, emanating from from a from a from a the um, federal executive council, you know, superintended by the president himself. Mm. Now, the, the, the you know such policy will now be driven home by the federal minister of education. It's a key responsibility mm. over the three ministers you have in the federal minister of education. Yes, if indeed they are doing this without approval of uh, Professor Tahir, you know, who is uh, the minister of education, mm. then we want to ask what has it done about it because for me a vice chancellor that has approved such increase mm. without approval in a clearly written memo to the federal minister of education, education. and a, a reply on the approval received in the same manner mm. going on ahead to implement you know price a hike in a in a in a, in a education mm. fees you know is it's a dismissible offense. Okay. You, you ought not to last more than a, more than twenty four hours, forty eight hours after such uh, such a action has been taken mm. by such a vice chancellor, by such a rector, by such a provost. There is need for us to return to the drawing board. Mm. What I am trying to say is that if the minister is unaware, you know, is unaware. Now he is aware. He has to call these people to order. He has to suspend all the hikes. And someone a so someone a stakeholders a meeting on mm. this. You have a you have a, 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 a parent a, a, you know a, a bodies, a fora here and there. Yeah. You have a, you have the committee of vice chancellors. You have a, uh, for uh, polytechnics uh, colleges of education. Mm. They they have a fora. They have to all come together at least their leadership, and bring their arguments to the table. Asu is there also. Mm. Asu can represent can represent the parents in this case because they are the ones who are on ground mm. in the universities. They know what is going on. They know what the students are going through. You know, we, I also believe that saying that they are um, um, introducing new uh, fees uh, in order to save the sector, mm. I don't think that the problem of uh, tertiary education in the country is solely about inadequate funding. Yeah. It goes beyond inadequate funding. There needs to be a total overhaul, ranging from curriculum, pedagogy, mm. to the fees charged. You know, like I said, I am not an apostle of free education mm. because it, it, it doesn't, whatever you give totally free, doesn't quite you know, it has no work. value. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it has no value. Mm. Free education is free indeed in Nigeria because it's education without content. Because this was what I argued you know? with somebody yesterday. He said um, somebody was arguing that the uh, the rise is good to make it more valuable that people who can actually afford to go to universities. With, because he, he also made a point that Nigerians go outside Nigeria and they pay more than that as uh, tuition fee outside Nigeria. Yeah, but they get value for their money. So you, you know, that so was what he was saying. Yeah. So maybe he was, in his opinion, he feels like this will actually add more value to the education system, sector. And I asked him, so somebody that cannot afford to pay, he, that, then he said, this is where we explore other measures. We have entrepreneurial uh, skill acquisition and all of that. That Nigerians have to actually put this into consideration and pay more attention to these things. Because skill, skill acquisition can actually work hand in hand with education. You, know, you don't have to be in the it, classroom. That, that is why I talked about curriculum, pedagogy, you know, and mm. all that. You need to go down back, you know, to the content. What it, it content and delivery. Okay. That's what I mean by pedagogy. Mm. You know, if you if you are not able to deliver content commensurate to the level of education you claim 
to have uh, imbued in a, in a graduate, then you have actually, the system has actually failed. Okay. You know, so can we, in all sincerity, say that the Nigerian um, uh, educational curriculum at in, in all levels, you know, and especially at the tertiary level, mm. is actually servicing the educational uh, and knowledge needs of the society. We cannot say that. So you, you will discover that you have curriculum or curricula that don't actually, actually address the industry need. There's what you call town and gown, you know. If you reduce a town to be uh, the industry mm. that will uh, assimilate, utilize the knowledge being produced, while gown can now represent for us the, the, the citadel of learning, the institutions themselves. You know, there must be, there must be a link between the two. The link must be such that the, the knowledge you produce should be utilized by the industry. It's not so. Let me give you an example okay. with the, the uh, banking sector. If you go to the banking sector, you, you know, many, if not most, universities, uh, polytechnics, and so on and so forth mm. in Nigeria have banking and finance departments producing graduates of banking and finance. Ask yourself, can they be deployed to the banking sector without being retrained by the banks? My, my, my investigation shows that the products, even at the investing level of banking and finance, cannot be deployed. Right. They can be deployed directly. Some of them are retrained for upward of six months by these banks. So, what has the individual been doing? In for four or five four years four in five university. Years? Do you understand what I'm saying? So, we need to return to the drawing board and begin to look at both content and delivery. You know, curricula, pedagogy, we need to look at all this. Look at the industry. What are the areas of need in, need in Nigeria? Mm. So that we tell law whatever we do to be of use, of relevance. We are getting to the point where the, the, the certificate we carry, you know, the certificate they carry doesn't really uh, amount to much except the, 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 the certificate. Mm. Certificate is merely an evidence that you have attained this level of knowledge, yeah. this level of training. That is what certificate means. Certificate is not an end in itself. Certificate is an it's it's, it's it's evidential of what you have attained. In other words, it's not the certificate that the society, Nigeria and the nation requires. It's the level that you have attained. In other words, if you are a, if you are a graduate, mm. if you are a postgraduate, we want to see you deliver discharge at, at the level you know, that, that mm. responsibility at that level you know that your certificate claims that you are capable of discharging mm. it's not happening at the moment so it's not a matter of increasing fees we need to return to the drawing board we need to rejig the entire system to have us have a proper educational uh, uh, system that is knowledge based because you know the saying goes that you can't give what what you don't have. And uh, it is not, you know, the, the, the low quality of uh, today's graduates is not a reflection of uh, their intellectual capacity. No, mm. it's not true. Today's Nigerians are even smarter than their parents. They are smarter than their parents. Mm. So if they can't, you know, measure up to expectations, blame the system and not the students. Do you understand what yes. I'm saying? For example, you go to... Um, Nigeria universities. I, 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 you know, I was privileged to attend both state and federal you, you know, universities, north and south, mm. and I can tell fairly well what is going on in the system. I can tell. You can see that the the, the system is 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 really really not working anymore. So the students may be there. You don't even find willing lecturers who. No. You know who have what you call in organizational psychology affective commitment when you say affective commitment mm. in a organizational psychology in industrial psychology you are talking about commitment to work to the point that your soul your heart That's everything, everything is there. you're mm. seeing the work as an extension of yourself that is what it ought to be you don't find that anymore in a, the system mm. the teachers do you understand that? So the students are allowed to roam, you know, roam the streets, roam around. They, 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 they are too free 
too free because the system is not engaging enough, it's not challenging enough. Mm. That's what I found. And something needs to be done about that. And that is why courtism has become such a big deal in, uh, in, in Nigeria. Mm. Nigeria today is one thing the tertiary institutions have, uh, you know, uh, manufactured, developed, and uh, <laughs> given to Nigerian society. It has permeated the whole system, courtism, to the point that it has now reached primary schools yes. in Nigeria, mot motor parks, you know, mechanics, mm. all of them, traders, they all have one cult or, or the, the other. other. You know, you go to places, you will see them fully decked in uniforms mm. and to the teeth, moving around the streets, and the police do nothing about these things. You know, so it's a total problem, a complete problem that we have. So not just hike in, in, a, in a school fees. No, that's not, that is perhaps, you know, one of the uh, problems, and certainly not the first, we need yeah. to return to drawing board. And this is, you know, uh, putting the responsibility squarely there, uh, you know, uh, in uh, the, uh, the office of uh, the Honorable Minister of uh, Education, mm -hmm. Professor Tahir. I believe, uh, I believe he should be able to do something. All right. Okay. Why uh, we wait and hope that uh, Honorable is able to do something? But what can the student do? Because I feel like as the students and the parents are the most affected. Because yeah. we see that uh, protests are ongoing in Uniland. The students have begun protests. But is that the right way to go about it? Is what, that what else do you want them to do? They have to protest. Because you know? we all know that protest doesn't really yield any results here in Nigeria. Yeah, but the, if uh, the federal minister of education is uh, pretending to be unaware then something has to be done to draw his attention so i really think that the protest is called for it is okay. how else do you engage somebody who is failing to be dumb and deaf if you do something you make some noise mm. right yes you know to borrow from a bongo of uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's make some noise <laughs> <laughs> All right, now <laughs> away from the issues of education, let's uh, talk about headers clashes that we've been having so far in Nigeria. Uh, this headline from the Nigerian Tribune today says that uh, President Tinubu has received a proposal for, minister, for Ministry of Livestock. So they are proposing to have a Ministry of Livestock that with hope that this will solve the issue of headers clashes. Uh, crisis in Nigeria. Do you think that's that's what we need at this point it's, it's to solve that it's, problem? It's unnecessary. Very, very unnecessary. You see, um, for me, livestock is business, right? Mm. And the government simply has to regulate it. You know, you have Ministry of Livestock, probably you have to have a Ministry of uh, uh, Motor Spapers, mm. Ministry of... Do you get all this? Yes. You don't need that. Of course, you have full-blown uh, Federal Ministry of Agriculture. And they, All of this should fall under that. It is, it, they have a whole department that is dealing with livestock. Mm. You know, so you, you don't proliferate um, uh, ministries to uh, address uh, some of uh, these uh, perennial problems. The headers of uh, farmers' uh, crashes in Nigeria is persisting because of one factor, lack of political will. They know the truth. You understand that? Mm. They know the truth and they don't want to address it. Let me, let, let me tell you where the foundation is coming from. You see, indigenous Nigerians believe that the land where they were born, mm. right? Indigenous Nigerians, where they were born, is ancestral, is their land. Do you understand that? Yes. The headers, on the other hand, is saying that the land belongs to everybody. Body. Mm -hmm. This is the foundation. Mm. Do you understand that? And in fact, they are even of the opinion that if you don't want the cattle to uh, damage your crops, then you have to fence in your farm. There was this problem didn't start today. I read one judgment um, that dates back to, I think, 1967, something like that. And the judge was saying, you are the one that brought your cattle to a farm that is sitting there. Mm. And you're asking the farmer to provide a fence to, 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 to stop your farm, to stop your, your heads mm. that you led to the farm. Even if there is such a possibility, what is the guarantee that your cattle will still not tear down such a fence? Mm. It is the duty of uh, the owner of the cattle to do something 
uh, to ensure that it does not destroy anybody's farm. Do you understand that? Yeah. This is where the problem is. I have seen videos where headers uproot, you know, crops and feed their cattle. I have seen videos where where headers burn burn farms in order to uh, you know have a, what you may call a early um, early grassing mm. of the area to feed their cattle. In other words, you are you are destroying the farms to enable your, your own uh, your own uh, your, your, your own uh, uh, cattle to grow and the uh, and the blossom, mm. right? Now, where is the principle of live and let live? It doesn't require a ministry to deal with this. That is one level of the problem. Mm. There is even a greater concern when it comes to what you call modern ways of uh, rearing uh, cattle. We, Nigeria is not the only country that rears uh, cattle. If you go to internet and Google, you know, um, cattle rearing countries in terms of their export and production volume, mm. Nigeria does not make even the first 20. And yet we still keep having the issues of problems. Mm. You don't have problems of uh, headers farmers in those countries. That's why I say it's all political. Why don't you move up where the world is now is ranching? You need to you need to confine your cattle in places. Mm. I'd expect that. I think it was the um, uh, um, His Excellency uh, uh, Dr. Omar Ganduje that, that attempted to start a ranch in Kano when he was governor. Mm. So uh, I don't know to what extent he went with that. For me, the state governments should benefit they should try to they should try to set up ranches mm. you know north and south it's not just a northern thing it's true that the, uh, most of the cattle uh, migrate from uh, north to south yes there should be holding places for the cattle when they go south yeah so what stops a state governor from setting up a ranch to hold the cattle that come into his state mm. do you get my point yes you know, so w some of them will uh, come up with this uh, lame and feeble uh, anti-grazing uh, uh, law. That is not sufficient. The cattle are in your place. And if they are not there, they are bound to come. Mm. Because, you see, desertification has become an issue in Nigeria. If you go to uh, Upper Lake Chad, busy, mm. you see that Lake Chad itself is uh, shrinking what does that tell you? It's evidence of desert desertification. And that is why the federal government at a point, even they contemplated um, a policy they called the recharging the Lake Chad. Okay. Recharging Lake Chad means pumping water into it from somewhere else in order to retain the volume. What that means is that desertification is affecting mm. not only Lake Chad, but also the entire, the entire uh, zone. So, what does that tell you? It means that the area where the cattle feed is now dwindling, forcing them to seek pasture somewhere else. That is why more of them are going down south. Mm. So, it is not just for sales. They are going down south for pasture. Do you understand that? Yes. So, what are the governors doing? All right, let's take provide, this call. Mm. Provide ranches. Okay. That's Hello, it. good morning. Good, good morning to you. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. And how is Captain? Very well, thank you. Okay, thank you. Let me continue to this uh, topic. Okay. Yes, actually, just like uh, your analyst said, and uh, no, uh, the truth of the matter is that we had, uh, we have, we have agriculture ministry, right, in a system, mm -hmm. and of course, if I, if I'm not for, uh, uh, at least. It's not quite long I left there. Uh, even though it's quite long, we left secondary school. But we all know that agriculture is comprised of uh, uh, planting and rearing of animals. Mm. So now I'm wondering why there will be a kind of separation of uh, livestock ministry. But anyway, let's assume that exists now, okay? Because we are trying to look for a solution. Mm. But the federal government has to be very, very careful in the sense that it should not be strictly for just only one set of uh, ethnic group because there is going to be uh, resources
nothing involved in it and whatever. So everybody in Nigeria as well are animal rearers. So they should put consideration into this. I'm not kicking against the creating an avenue whereby the, the animal rearers will have a kind of large range of a ranch mm. whereby it will be safer than moving all around and encountering and endangering themselves. Okay? So, but in as much as it, there will be empathy in doing this, because it, it is not only Fulani, for instance, mm. the real animals. Okay? So, government have to put consideration into this. And also, if this is an incentive, they should not forget the farmers. When I say farmers, it's not only Yoruba or Igbo or Hausa. Mm. Farmers are farmers. Okay? So, there should not be any kind of uh, 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 um, uh, a kind of um, maybe uh, um, selective uh, stop because it's still going to create problems. Even though they will solve a problem there mm. of clashes between the rearers and the, the farmer. farmers, mm. but still that will not solve entire problem that is existing. A lot of things still has to be done in terms of religion. You see this religious stuff. I think it is high time. Now, we know whether we are secular state or not. I am a Muslim. I have a lot of Christians around me. But how do we live? Because this thing, aside even, let's leave, forget about tribalism. Mm. You see, this religion of a thing, let's know how, because I know my religion does not preach me to harm another person. That is the sincere thing about it. Mm. But people take advantage. And it's not only Islam Muslim. Both Christians and Muslims are, are, are Muslims. They take advantage. Most of all these preachers and whatever, whatever they belong to, they are politicians. And this, most, most Nigerians are not so educated even in the religion, whether it is Islam or Christian. So whatever they tell them is what they take. Mm -hmm. This is what we are having problems. So right. see, the mm. truth of the matter is that uh, this life talk stuff, yeah. Let's see how, because we want to see what the reaction of the president and the federal government, how it's going to be implemented. Okay, so that's thank you very God bless much. Nigeria. Thank you so much. Thank you, you for know, your time. Yeah, um, he he, he re-echoed me in some uh, uh, ways. Hmm. You see, for me, like our Mark said, religion is an opium of the masses. Do you understand that? Hmm. Religion has been more of a problem to Nigeria than a solution because of the way we practice it if you have visited countries like turkey israel they understand that mm. rome so i have seen islam in practice i have seen christianity in practice, in practice. there is a whole world apart between the way we it's practice islam and christianity in nigeria and what you find out there even in the places that should be considered as, as the, the home origin, of, home of those the origins, mm. the homes of these uh, religions. The, honest, the question is, the question is why the reason is simple: our level of uh, civilization. Our problem is not is not education. Our problem is civilization now. Nigerians are still down there at the level what you may call the very first stage of human existence, where you are trapped in the struggle for. Uh, you know, what you call a food, clothing and shelter. Mm. The way Abraham Maslow would uh, put it in his hierarchy of needs uh, theory. Do you understand? That is why we are trapped. You know, that is why you see this uh, primitive accumulation. Everything we do, when they steal money from government coffers, what do they dump the money in? In housing. They use it to do what you call a, you know, um, a, um, a banking. Mm. They do house banking. They do, do land banking. How many of them is talking or thinking in terms of industries? Nobody. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. So when you look at the gap between uh, consumption and production in Nigeria, it becomes self-evident that Nigerians are not interested in production. They are more interested in consumption. Mm -hmm. And that is why government is not even focusing on what to do to uh, create what you call ease of doing business. Ease of doing business in Nigeria should rank about the worst in the whole world is a fact mm. you have no light the processes are not working mm -hmm. bureaucracy and all those things you just can't get things done here do you understand that and most of these things are political for example when you say 
that the whole country mm. must uh, uh, depend on what we call the national grid for receiving electricity. You are not being realistic. Okay. It's not because possible. we are going to come to the constant it's collapse of that. That is it. So the darkness you get is based on politics. The kind of leadership you have, mm. the thoughts, the thought process is not refined enough. So you don't have leaders who are really looking at the nation holistically. Mm. They are looking at the nation from the prism of, a, of religion, from the prism of ethnicity. Okay. You see it in appointments. You see it in policy directions. You will say you, you, you become the president of Nigeria. 80% mm. of federal key appointments go to your ethnic group. Do you see the problem? Mm. Only one or two presidents, you know, ma showed maturity and looked for competence wherever they could find. You know, somebody like uh, Obasanjo, you know, mm. he was able to shake that ethnic uh, inclination. He looked for Nigerians everywhere, even outside Nigeria, deployed them, and he showed in uh, his level okay. of performance mm. as president. You know, though I'm not his fan, I quarrel with him all the time, <laughs> but you must give him that. Do you understand that? Yes. Compare him with the uh, Obasanjo. No, compare Obasanjo and Buhari. Sorry. Compare Obasanjo and Tinubu. Tinubu mm. is just b barely 100 days in office. Mm. But 80% of key appointments are all Yorubas. The records are there. Go to all the paramilitary, you know, immigration mm. prisons. Do you understand that? Look at all of them. Look at the army. Look at the police. Look at civil defense. All Yorubas. You know, so you don't do that in a country where you have 250 ethnic groups that are brought together into one country. Why do you have a federation? You have a federation for what you call political economies of scale. Mm. That means you, you know, you, you believe in, like the Igbos would say, Igwebike, that there is unity in number mm. and, uh, you know, and, the, and the, you know, there is strength in mm. unity mm. and number. Mm. That's what Igwebike means. It means that coming together rather than exist as Igbo, as Yoruba, mm. and as Hausa, you you be, you, you be stronger. Mm. You be bigger and stronger if you come together. How does that, you know, uh, translate to what you really uh, call a uh, um, uh, you know betterment, greater progress? Mm. It is in making use of the best you find in uh, all the ethnic groups. So do you find that in what is going on now? You want me to believe that. The eighty percent of these appointments mm. are, you know, only the people appointed from the southwest could best deliver. Do you understand? It's mm. not possible now. So you can see that the quality of thoughts, the kind of leadership, you know, I say the whole thing is civilization. Mm. Is civilization? I keep saying, you know, everywhere I go, I keep saying that everything rises and falls on leadership. Once you take leadership away, away. everything collapses. Even in the family. Mm. So if you want to change Nigeria, think in terms of leadership. Think okay. in terms of you know, leadership that is competent, visionary, that is imbued with integrity. Mm. If you don't get it, whatever you see, you take. All right. Uh, moving away from that, because I'm looking at all of our national dailies, and it's more like we have moved to, from some of the issues that we used to have into other issues because right now people hardly even talk about the issues of insecurity like the way we used to talk about it because people are more focused on the issues at hand, the cost of fuel, Good. trust of Food. transportation. But then when I looked at the, um, the punch this morning, I want you to listen to these figures. 586 people were killed in August. In August alone. August of this year, just this past month. Yeah. And 369 were abducted. Nobody is talking about that. If we can get this figure in one month, nobody talks about it. People are more concerned about how to get by by like by the day. But that means if you know that five hundred and eight, that means somebody you know somewhere you know, has died. You know, let me tell you, Nigeria. I, I, I was um, I was in a uh, a program, a book launch, uh, marking uh, the sister. Uh, um, anniversary, you know, birthday mm. of uh, Professor Udenta Udenta. And uh, the program was chaired by His Excellency Dr. Goodluck Ebele Jonathan. He made one important statement. He said that Nigeria is still a country and not a nation. Okay. Goodluck Jonathan, less than two weeks ago. You know, if you 
backtrack mm. to about two years ago, Obasan Joe made exactly the same statement in Oka. Mm. That Nigeria is still a, a country, country and, and not, not a, a nation. nation. Do you see the problem? Now, if you put what these uh, two uh, great uh, Nigerian uh, leaders you know, have said in context, what they simply tell you is that Nigeria is still on a journey to becoming a nation. Mm. Now, we started out as a federation, as a fe you know, practicing federal system of government. The military came and truncated the process. And over time, because of uh, the military interregnums that we have witnessed over time since uh, 1966 to date, you know, you will see that the military, because of either their direct uh, uh, influence when they are when they, uh, uh, running military regime, that's a direct administration, you know, by, by a junta military, mm -hmm. unelected, they shot their ways into Asoro. Uh, right mm. and then nobody can stop them and we have had that right from the days of uh uh Irun Se to the last one we we have had which is Absalani mm. all of them have uh, been responsible for the kind of constitution we run you know they they believe that nigeria can be organized only as a unitary system and it is shown in the kind of constitution they give us that is why you have centralized police. Nigeria, you know, <laughs> excuse me, in Nigeria, you have, um, you have one centralized police system because a section of the constitution says that Nigeria shall have only one okay. police. Mm. So if, even if you have a um, uh, Yambanga, you mm. have a, a joint mm. civilian a, a, a task force, you have a, a vigilante operations, you have uh, even the Hizba police. They can never they be the are one. all in Lego. Mm. They are all upfront to the Nigerian constitution. You know, all this talk about Amote Kun, about the Babago, illegality. Because the constitution says that there shall be only one police force. Now that you have seen that that proclamation and prescription of the Nigerian constitution is not working, you address it. You don't address a constitutional lacuna by is staging an affront on it. No. Mm. You don't form a babago or his bar or this is. What you do is to constitutionally decentralize the Nigeria police system. It is time for state police, for community police. That's the point I'm making. Okay. That's what it must be. And that is why I said that I don't understand the Tinubu approach to governance. He is laying emphasis on things that don't really matter. As far as I am concerned. Like, because I you think know, all of this see, is in, you know, in you a you way see, to secure the economy. You, you, he has gone secure the economy. He has rather destroyed the economy. When he removed fuel subsidy, in the way and manner he did without any, any preparations, is, you know, is reminiscent of a medical doctor performing an operation <laughs> on, 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 a, on, a, on a patient without anesthesia. Mm -hmm. The patient can die of shock. That is what is going on in Nigerian economy now. Mm. Nigerian economy is in a state of shock. And to add injury to it, you know, to add salt to that injury, he floated the Naira. When you are not exporting any, anything, go to the, the, the uh, uh, um, documents you find in Nigeria Bureau of Statistics. You see that Nigeria's export is still 75% 70, crude. What does that tell you? It tells you that you are not exporting much beyond crude oil. And the crude oil you, you, you export, you cannot even export to full capacity. We, I don't know what the figure is now, but at a point, we were given a quota of 2.3 million by OPEC mm. per day. But by the time uh, uh, Tinubu came in, we were not, we were not exporting any more than 1.5 million. And recently, the National Security Advisor, Rebadu, told us that Nigeria is still losing up to 400,000 barrels of crude oil mm. to theft. Mm. Security. Everything is going back to security. So you cannot address economy without first dealing with security. I had expected a technical committee working on how to implement yeah. state and, and community police. You don't have anything there. There's nothing in that direction. In other words, 
you know, President Tinubu wants to retain the security architecture the way it is. You know, changing the service chiefs and the IGP or police mm. is just one factor. Nigeria police problem is structural. You cannot run a federal system of government from a centralized police uh, source. Mm. Go, you can Google it. There are 12, 26 countries of the world that practice federalism. Yeah. Only Nigeria is practicing a centralized police That's system. True. And how many are they? About 400,000 officers and men policing 210 million of us. Is it possible? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And you say, and that is why the the the, the uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty of Nigeria has been challenged by non-state actors. You can see the escalation of the, what you call ungoverned uh, spaces. spaces. The ungoverned spaces are widening by the day, and the criminals are becoming more and more emboldened because the police is weak, is inadequate mm. in terms of number in terms of structural formation, in terms of centralization, in terms of motivation, in terms of salary. Hmm. What is the salary of a police inspector? I met a DPO that told me that he gets 20,000 Naira a month to run his division. Is 20,000 Naira for fuel or for a charge guard or for what? So you can see that even from day hmm. of the police force is clearly lacking. But then you are also clamoring for state policing. So how would that be funded? You, the, it becomes the responsibility of, of the, the states. states. Okay. The states are partly funding the Nigeria police. If you go, there, there's, no, there's no state governor that is not periodically buying, a, you know, um, equipment for the police, especially vehicles, and the all the personnel mm. carriers and all that. They do that, but it's, it's, it's not official. They do that as a kind of donation. But when the state is running its own police force, the federal police will concentrate on certain areas of policing. And the laws will be there to check the excesses. And of course, that's why I talked about a technical committee being put in place. You don't just amend the constitution and say, look, let, let the states create uh, their own police. Mm. There will be chaos. Because the crop of politicians you have now they are perhaps the most terrible you can find anywhere in the world. They will abuse the police force if you don't put certain certain uh, systems in place. If you don't do that, if you don't do if you don't put certain mechanisms in place, some of these state governors will not even allow certain people to enter the state again using the police force. <laughs> so we need to we need to do a technical study of what must be done in order to have a functional community, state, and federal police. At the moment, we don't have. Just one last line on this. You see, we live in the federal capital territory. You are talking about the number of people that have died nationwide. Do you know the number of people abducted in FCT alone this month, if not this week? Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm. You know, the criminals are so, so emboldened. They now move from a state to a state, as we speak. They move from a state to a state and carry operations, carry out operations that last for hours. And Nigeria police force cannot do anything. In Abuja, where the president lives, do you understand that? Hmm. So perhaps the only place safe, even in Abuja now, is the Asorok itself. Every other part of that. You see, I saw a release, I think, uh, from uh, the police uh, 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 public relations or something like that, source like that, was telling us to beware of this place, beware of that, you know, they, give, they tell you places like uh, Guarimpa, mm. they tell you places like uh, under the bridge area one, they tell you don't go to, um, don't go to city gate, mm. no, if, you are, if your car breaks down there, run away, excuse <laughs> me, <laughs> so you know where these problems are, why don't your you men the problem. concentrate? Do you see the problem? Mm. So the police is telling you, run away from that place. <laughs> what does that mean? If you send a distress call from that place, you can't see any police. You're on your own. You, you already told you. Somebody told me about a place somewhere in Canada. I said that uh, by 7, that uh, you will see police there again. I asked why. Say for security reasons. <laughs> 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 you know, we laugh about these things. But it's actually tragic. <laughs> we ought to be crying. Mm. Do you understand that? True. The fact remains that we are not addressing 
the problems we have, the way we should be addressing them. Yes, economy is important. But the solution the president is bringing to the economy. I just mentioned Naira flotation mm. and the and, uh, um, and the, the subsidy, subsidy removal. removal. That's two key examples of wrong-headed policies. Not that the policies are wrong in themselves. The timing, the process. Yes, yeah, some people will argue that there is no good time to remove the subsidy. It's a lie. I'll tell you the good time to remove the subsidy. Please tell if us. You <laughs> are, if you are serious, right? First and foremost, you create a timetable. Look, Nigeria's subsidy is going... January 1, 2024. We all know that we have six months, right? And between now and this date, we are going to do A, B, C, D. Mm. What that means is that if you are not able to do those things, you, you can't cannot remove. remove the subsidies. That's the point I'm making. Mm. For example, we are talking about uh, liquefied natural gas. What do we do to utilize for our vehicles the gas? That, what that means is that government needs to intervene by bringing in what you call CAG compliant buses. Government needs to, even in NNPC filling stations that are scattered all over the country, to install CNG CNG facilities. Mm. Government needs to help, you know, uh, indigenous uh, 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 auto, auto manufacturers and uh, auto this and that to do something uh, about capacity to install CNG compliant carburetors or, or injectors, there must be a way. Why uh, it's not novel, it's not rocket science. These things have been done in other countries. So, why is it rocket science in Nigeria? You just remove fuel subsidy and moved you move the, the, the fuel from 197 to 540 mm -hmm. to 670. And when labor went there and then move, moved again to move it to 710. Mm -hmm. And their labor ruined. You say, we assure you, there will be no further increase. So that it's means the increase, increase was intentional. It was intentional. That's the point. You just took it off my, off, off my tongue. Mm. It was intentional. It means that 617 Naira you, ha you have as a pump price of fuel. It's artificial. Fixed by NNPC, arbitrarily. Not determined by the fo market forces. Mm. That's what it means. Because if you are claiming that this is a product of uh, that is a product of, of, uh, market forces. of market forces, you cannot intervene. What that means is that the pr the, the pump price will be moving up and down mm. on its own, as regulated by market forces. But now you came to tell Nigerians that there will be no fall down increase. increase. What that means is that you have For you to be able to intervene, yeah. that means there is no market force. Because that's you can't work force, against the market force. That, that's it. So you can see that themselves, they know what they are doing. Mm. They arbitrarily, artificially fixed this. And they are, you know, they are working towards moving it to... I think I understand that their target is 800 Naira. You understand mm. that? Now, they say... You, I was listening to Ngilari the other day, the spokesman Madam of the president. president. I, I, I hope I got the pronunciation of his name right. <laughs> you know, he was talking about uh, Nigerian fuel being the least priced, right? Mm. As he asked himself, and those is, he speaks for, the, the minimum, the, wage, the of minimum wage of those countries. Do you understand what mm. I'm saying? He hasn't. Minimum wage is even one of the things you have to address before you remove the subsidy. But as at now, it's still 30,000 Naira, and the 30,000 Naira, more than 50 states in Nigeria have not paid. And those who are paying are in arrears. And you are proposing to move it, they have the 60,000 mm. to 80,000, when you have not been able to pay the 30,000. Mm. Can't you say that there is something that's not adding up here? Mm. You haven't been able to deal with the to deal with uh, the figures I, 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 that is uh, smaller, mm -hmm. now you want to trade, you know, double or you know, triple, perhaps quadruple, <laughs> and you want me to believe that you are sincere about this. Mm. Nigerians are strictly on their own. That's all I see. The all right. government has failed Nigerians. Let's face reality. They are not addressing issues. So Nigerians are now at the short end of the, st of the stick. They are the receiving end. And government ought to be there for the people. Mm. You know, two reasons. 
I think it was John Locke, a one of the you know a, a classic uh, uh, political thinkers yeah. that was saying that told us that mm. the two reasons we have government mm. is for security and for welfare. welfare. We have um, none. Um, all right, thank you so much. Uh, it's been amazing talking thank to you, you, Dr. Law, as always. Oh, it's always you. amazing to talk to you because thank you. I'm very sure that our viewers really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you I so much for coming did. on the program. Yeah. All right, with that, we'll draw the curtain today on the press coming to you live from the Abuja studios of Kaftan Television. So I come your way next time. I am Sandra Ago. See you later.